Good morning to everybody. Once again, uh, a warm welcome as we join together around God's Word here at St. Olaf's. Uh, just your thoughts and prayers for Deirdre Pinio, former member of ours, now living in England, came out to South Africa, sadly had a fall on the Umschlange beachfront, and um, uh, is now making her way to, she had an operation, she's now making her way to Cape Town, where she will recover. So we remember Deirdre, and also please pray for John and Judith Williams, their son, uh, Lyndon lives in Prague, Czechoslovakia. He's been diagnosed uh, with advanced cancer. He's had an operation. They're on their way to see him. Uh, and these matters weigh heavily on our hearts. And so we pray for John um, and for Judy. Now, I'm just taking a break from Ecclesiastes just for one week. We'll be back with it next week, God willing, because uh, Bishop Warri Carl Edwards is speaking at our church on Sunday. But I want to carry on with the same theme that we addressed last week when, the, when Solomon, the author of, Eccle of Ecclesiastes, uh, remarked 38 times through the book that life is meaningless. And for many people, they do find that that is true, that there doesn't seem to be any meaning to life. And so I'm coming to Psalm 8, which is a psalm which asks the question, asks and answers the question, who am I? Sadly, it is a question that many people have and ask and don't always find the right questions. Who am I as a human being? And as I say, David reflects on this in Psalm 8, and we'll read verses as we go through as usual. So the first two verses, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. The place to start looking for the answer, who am I, uh, is not with ourselves, but is in fact with God. That's ex exactly, precisely what David is doing here. He's starting with God. Uh, and as David considers the wonder of the universe, the vastness of this universe in which we live, he reflects on the glory of God and the character of God. Einstein, the famous uh, scientist, once said, I feel like a man chained. I get a glimpse of reality and then it flees me. If only I could be free from the shackles of my intellectual smallness, then I could understand the universe in which I belong. David reminds us the vastness of this universe, which even the best minds that have ever lived could never quite get their heads around reminds us that God is eternal, that God has no, no beginning, He will have no end. As the Bible says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. There never was a time when God did not exist, and there never will be a time when He will not exist. I, the Lord, do not change. God is independent. The technical word the theologians use is that He is immutable. God cont lives contained and happy within himself. He is totally independent of his creation. For his own plans and purposes, he brought the creation and creatures as human beings into existence, but he could have existed quite happily forever in eternity without ever having done that. So God is perfect. God is sovereign, which simply means that he is ruler over the universe, that is in control of the unfolding of the world's history, even when at times we don't understand it and doesn't seem to be the case, and that God is omnipotent, that he is all-powerful. In his own words, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind, is anything too hard for me. And so verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 2 reflect the character of God, who he really is, that he is eternal, omnipotent, mighty, and yet for his own out of the love of his own heart and for his own plans and purposes, he brought creation and us human beings into being. Now, we go on and we uh, have a look at uh, verse 3. And he says there, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than the angels, crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. So we are made, we human beings are made in God's image and we are cared for by him. That's the Bible's view. It's so sad that we live in a world that has become so secular 
that it thinks it can exist without God, without any reference to God. So many of our friends and family just live without any thought of God or reference to Him. And as a result of this pessimistic humanism, pessimistic secularism, this is the reason why there are so many problems today. This is why people battle to understand who they are, why they're here, and what they are supposed to be doing. We human beings, with a crowning act of God, we are made in His image, and despite the fact of the, of the events of Genesis chapter 3, where our original ancestors fell into sin, so we who have been born ever since then, every generation that's been born ever since then, we are fallen creatures. In our nature we are scarred and marred. We seek at all costs, in general terms as I mentioned, to live independently of God, and yet nevertheless still, uh, we are made in his image. We bear his image. Or as Francis Schaeffer, one of the great, great uh, philosopher, apologist, theologians of the 1970s and 80s said, man still stands in the image, twisted, broken, abnormal, but still the image bearer of God. And Augustine, the great theologian of the 4th century, the first of Africa's great theologians, Augustine, North Africa, said, man is a good thing spoiled. Now, what do we mean when we talk about the image of God? I'm just using the, man, the word man as generic. It includes men and women, obviously. What is the image of God in man? What does it mean? Well, it means at least four things, and I'll run through them very quickly. It means that we are created in such a way that we can have spiritual experience. In other words, we are, we are religious beings. Now, we sometimes try to deny that, but we are religious beings. We have a heart, we have a mind, we have a conscience. The conscience is always aware of its obligation to honor and worship God because God is spirit and we bear the image of God and there's something innate within us that makes us want to worship. We need to worship. We see it, for example, in the life of Abram, that he became the friend of God. We see it in the life of David, that he was described as a man after God's own heart. We have a unique ability that the rest of the animal kingdom does not have, placed deep within us, that we can and wish to and need to worship God. And because we are religious beings, if we don't worship the true and living God, then we will find a false God, perhaps a God of our own making. We will find someone or something else to worship instead of worshiping the true God. And that's what we mean when we talk about idols, putting idols in the place of God. In many ways, atheism is an idol. It's trying to find a, an answer to life apart from God. Today, we worship power. We worship political parties. We worship sports, sports people, celebrities. We might worship our leisure. We might worship our business, our wealth, our position, our status. Or increasingly, it seems sadly, the devil himself. But we will find something or somebody to worship if we do not worship the one true creator God who made us in his likeness and image. The second thing about us human beings is that we are rational uh, beings. We are superior to the rest of the animal kingdom. We are able to create original thoughts. Now, I know when we were writing exams, we didn't think that we were able to come up with an original thought. But we are rational beings. We can think, we can reason, we can um, put things together, we can put things in logical sequence because that's the way that God has made us with that ability to do so. Thirdly, the third thing about us being made in the image of God is that we have a capacity for moral action. In other words, we know the difference between right and wrong. That's where the conscience comes in. We know the difference between what is true and what is, uh, and what is false. Uh, we know what is, what is wrong. We know when injustice is being perpetrated. That's why there's such a strong reaction at times in our communities, in our society, in our country, in the world, when obvious injustice goes unpunished. And there's this huge uproar and outcry, quite understandably and legitimately, that something must be done and what is wrong must be put right. It's innate within us because God has made us with that capacity to know what is right and what is wrong. The Ten Commandments, yes, they're on the two stones and the tablets, but they're also written on our hearts. 
We know them instinctively that this is the right way to live. The fourth thing about us humans is that we have an ability to be creative. We have aesthetic appreciation. We are a creative being. It stems directly from the fact that God himself is creative. God, the creativity of God is seen in the design uh, and the maker of all things, this wonderful world, now spoiled by us humans, but this wonderful world and creation that he brought into being. And so Philip Hughes says this, he says, we, we may justly say that the created order is the work not only of the supreme intellect, but also of the supreme artist. Now, obviously, our creativity is different to the creativity of God. We don't have the ability to make things out of nothing as God did when he created the heavens and the earth. But we can work creatively to bring into ever new relationships and combinations the inexhaustible ascetic potential latent in the forms and colors and harmonies that we find within God's created order. And this is reflected in art, in music, in literature, in architecture. Every succeeding generation is inspired by the masterpieces created by Michelangelo or Rembrandt or Monet and others. The treasury of great literature in its wonderful variety is more precious than mountains of money. The power of music which can elevate our spirits from the joyful logic of Bach to the emotional depths of Brahms or even a Welsh choir, or perhaps in our time, the Andrew Lord Lloyd Webber collection or the London Symphony Orchestra, or whatever it is that appeals to us in that wide range of musical variety. And all of this, all of these things, all of these areas of life are the harvest of the seed of creativity that is implanted in our human nature by God himself. And to go back to Philip Hughes, he says, though this lesser creativity I'll read that again. Through this lesser creativity, God invites us, as it were, to exult in the harmony of the whole and to take pleasure in all that is true, noble, just, pure, lovely and gracious and in so doing to magnify him who has created us in his own image. That tells us a little bit, very brief summary of what makes us different as human beings because we are created in the image of God. And that leads us to the third and final point, and very briefly now, which is man's dominion over creation and the world. As we read from verse 6, You made them, God made us, rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim, the paths of the seas, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God gave us the responsibility to be his caretaker, to look after this creation. We know well, as we live in our times, that instead of running the world, we're running the world. Instead of um, looking after the air, we pollute the air. We consume the natural resources at a phenomenal rate. We, we, we foul up the rivers and spoil the soil. No wonder we've got a green party. Their motives and intentions are good. I don't believe that their personal view, um, that what lies behind some of what they do is all that good because ultimately with human beings we are spoiled and it is all about power. But that's just as an aside. Is there an answer? Is there a way out? The writer of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2 verses 6 to 8, quotes Psalm 8, this very psalm we're looking at, Quote Psalm 8, verses 6 to 8. And in Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 9 and 10, it says this, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. God the Son became a man, became a human being, taken upon himself human nature, as a human being, Jesus kept the law of God in every part. Therefore, he was not subject to death's penalty. And he died and God raised him and enthroned him to, the, to his right hand, where he now exercises rule and authority over the world. God's plan for this earth, for this planet, and for this universe won't be frustrated or thwarted by our sin and by our rebellion. And even though we spoil the world, even though we make a mess of it, 
God's will cannot be thwarted. It cannot and will not be thwarted. And one day he's going to recreate the new heavens, but also the new earth. What God is doing in the meantime is that he is changing individuals one by one. He's raising up a new people who are called and chosen by him. And so God's answer to the problems we see all around us, including the ones we briefly described today, is to send Jesus into the world, as we said, and for us to respond to him by coming to Christ in repentance and faith. And God is creating a new world who will populate the new heavens and the new earth as we worship him together forever. Let's pray together. And I want to begin this prayer by reading a well-known verse from the book of Romans, where the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, and that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Dear Lord, I pray that anyone who is listening and who has never done so may call on your name and be saved, become part of the people of God, gain entry into heaven, and become part of your renewing activity when one day you will renew the new heavens and the new earth, which we long for and look forward to. Amen.